All right, good morning, good morning. If you haven't already, please come in and have a seat. We'll get started with our service here in about uh, 15 seconds. All right, welcome to Vicenza Bible Church. For those of you who are new here, we are a biblical and confessional church. Uh, We want to take the time this morning, if you haven't already, to be welcomed. Welcome uh, to VBC. Welcome to the Vicenza area. Welcome to Italy if it's your first time. If someone has not come up and talked to you, uh, we'll make sure to do that at the end. Pastor Chris will be at the the back today uh, to say hi if you haven't already been welcomed. But please, we want to get to know you. We want to get your contact information if you need help getting to church in the future or if you need anything else that we can assist you with uh, as you as you make the transition here or continue your time in Italy, please let us know. Next slide, please. All right, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 100, verses 1 through 4. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Let us do that this morning with our singing. As you please stand and welcome the worship team for our song of response. Nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain. Its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me. What is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. His will be done. His kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is himself our daily bread? Praise him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. We'll take a cup of kindness, yet all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. When on that day the great I am, the faithful and the true, the Lamb who was for sinners slain is making all things new. Hold our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light. And we shall
shall e'er his people be all glory be to christ all glory be to christ our king all glory be to christ his rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to christ be seated. So for those who are new uh, or those who have never heard, uh, we do the New City Catechism. Catechism is a fancy Greek word, right, which means to instruct or catechize is to instruct and catechesis is instructional information that Christians work through as a means historically of learning the gospel and our faith. So we take the New City Catechism, which comes from uh, the late Tim Keller's church. We're going to go through question six this morning. For those who are new, We'll take the question, I'll read the answer, and then I'll read the question a second time. At the conclusion of that second time, we'll read the answer together. It's how can we glorify God? We glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and by obeying his will, commands, and law. How can we glorify God? Glorify. All right, this morning as we take time, I hope you've done this throughout the week, but as we come in, we have an intentional confessional time where privately and corporately we go before God as we come before him today, prepared to sing, to worship, uh, to read, and to, to study his word, to hear his word preached. Before we do that, we want to make sure that we privately and corporately confess our sins as we come before him uh, with our expectations. So what I'll do this morning is I'll take some time, we'll privately pray, and then I'll pray for us corporately as we go before the Lord. O oh God, you know the depths of my depravity and the darkness of my soul. Nothing is hidden from your light that reaches every thought and diluted desire. In the darkness we feel there is no hope, no opportunity for escape from our iniquity. But you, you have made a way. That only we may choose to turn, follow, and escape from the bondage of our sins. Father, we come before you this morning humble and contrite, admitting our failure, confessing our sin, and earnestly seeking forgiveness. We will not be silent, but will acknowledge, confess, and turn from wickedness while you may be found. And for those who still reside in darkness, who feel too shamed and burdened to come forth into the light, will you let no obstacle hinder our repentance and no shame stop our hearts from returning to your light, your discipline, your mercy, and your righteousness. In the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Our assurance of forgiveness this morning comes from Ephesians verses 2, 4 through 7. And it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All right, this morning as we continue our worship, worship through giving, we're not going to have the offering plates passed around this morning, but behind the pillar in the center of the, uh, the room here, there's a basket that you can give to. And you can also give at vicenzabible.church slash give uh, online whenever you'd like.
All right, we'll continue our worship this morning through singing, so please stand, lift your hearts to God as the worship team comes back up. call of Christ our captive, for now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given, the shield of faith and belt of truth will stand against the devil's lies, an army bold. Whose battle cry is love, 
reaching out to those in darkness call to war to love the captive soul but to rage against the captor and with the sword that makes the wounded whole we will fight with faith and valor when faced with trials on every side we know the outcome is secure and christ will have the price for which he died an inheritance of nations come see the cross where love and mercy meet as the son of god is stricken then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and christ emerges from the grave this victory march continues till the day every eye and heart shall see him so spirit come put strength in every stride give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful as saints of old still line the way retelling triumphs of his grace we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with christ we stand in glory well good morning everyone you may be seated one of the lines that really stand out in that song is the sword that makes the wounded whole many times we don't think about swords as healing but as instruments of attack and uh that line there, um, of course, refers to the Word of God and how the Word of God heals and makes us whole and draws us to Him. And so our church, that's what we're about. That's why we're named Vicenza Bible Church. We're about the Bible, and the Bible is our source of authority. And it's not me. I, I'm not the authority here. It's, it's the Scripture. And so this morning as we've sang the Scripture and as we get into the sermon and understand the Scripture and listen to the Scripture, I, I hope you know this is the very voice of God right here that he's given to us. Not me, I'm not the voice of God. Thank God for that. But this is, this is the voice of God. And so he's privileged us to hear him, to listen to him, to receive him, to love him and enjoy him in that truth. Well, this morning we're going to pray before we get into the word and ask the Lord to guide us as we interpret the passage, as we understand it, as we most of all, apply it to our hearts and understand how do we live out these truths that God has given to us and that he's voiced to us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the text. Father, we bask this morning in your glory. as We dwell upon how wonderful and mighty and awesome you are. So we've sang songs that declare how holy, holy, holy you are. How your power and your might has rescued us from sin. How you sent your son to free us who were burdened and captivated by sin. And how your spirit moves us, sanctifies us, transforms us into the image of Christ. Lord, there are so many, so many truths for us to be thankful for this morning but first of all, we want to just praise and worship you for who you are. You are holy. You are good. You are righteous. And Lord, we give you the adoration that you're due for being who you are. 
you are God and we are not. And Lord, you have blessed us tremendously with so many blessings, most of all with yourself. You've given us you, God. There's nothing greater, there's nothing in this world, Father, that can even compare. And Lord, I ask that those who don't understand that this morning, God, I ask that they come to a saving faith and understand what salvation is. God, I ask that they behold your glory and treasure you and love you. Father, for those who have come in this morning who are believers, who enjoy a relationship with you, God, may their fellowship with you grow this morning. May their passion for you be inflamed and may they desire you and love you greater as they leave this place, God. Lord, for those who are burdened with sin, struggling this morning, maybe have walked in and their life is in a cloud. Maybe their mind is darkened. Maybe they just don't have hope. Father, may they look upon Christ today and see the eternal hope, the one who provides um, everlasting life. God, may we honor you May we worship you. Give us wisdom as we approach this passage this morning. Give us um, direction, not just to intellectually grab onto it, but with our hearts and our lives to live by it and to love your truth and love your word. Most of all, God, transform us into the image of Christ through this passage and into this week. God, you know how weak and feeble I am. May I not not cause any unnecessary confusion or stumbling because of my words this morning, but Father, may I be clear and humble in my speech. And may your word be received with hearts that are ready and ripe for the harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the land was full of excitement. Things were growing and hustling and and bustling. It was the early 17th century and the American colonies had sprouted. And in that, people had hopes of religious freedom and worshiping the Lord without a, a pope telling them what to do or without a king or queen telling them what to do. So many flocked to the American colonies in the early 17th century. One such man who came was named John Harvard. In 1636, he landed on American soil and hopes of a better life. See, he was a Puritan, and if you don't know who Puritans are, maybe sometimes in your mind you think these uptight, strict people, but they're nothing like that, actually. But a Puritan was one who desired to conform to the Bible, conform to the Word of God, just simply to live life and worship according to scripture, and not man-made devices. He fled, and he came to the colonies. John Harvard was a well-educated man. He graduated from Cambridge, and um, what he noticed early on was that there was not a college here in American soil yet. There was a need for an educational institute, the the institution that uh, would train up and indoctrinate ministers with uh, the truths of God's word in light of the world around them to study science, to study math, to study history, to study foreign languages, uh, based upon the fact that there is a sovereign God over all of these things, and creation points to God. So Harvard, as you probably could guess from the last name, started Harvard College, or what we know today, Harvard University. And Harvard University, or Harvard College, was started with the express purpose of teaching all the wonderful subjects that are out there today in light of the holy and awesome triune God. It was established to educate ministers, to uh, grow them in the other aspects of um, the world in order to uh, bring them to an understanding of how wonderful and creative God is and how beautiful he is. It was established for true wisdom to go forth and in live wisdom to go forth. In fact, 
in their student handbook, and this is from Harvard, mind you, listen to their goal, listen to what they told every student coming in at that point in time. It says, every student at Harvard is called to be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider, well, that the main end of his life and his studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay hold of Christ as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Now, that might baffle some of you to say that's from Harvard, because we fast forward to our time, and you look at Harvard now, and if that was to be in the student handbook, well, the world would go crazy, right? What happened? How do we go from then to now? One of the things that occurred was something called rationalism. See, about 100 years after the start of Harvard, rationalism infiltrated the studies. And what rationalism is, if you don't know what it is, it's the need to essentially explain every single thing. Um, and, and when you bring that to the scripture, um, that means you have to explain things like the miracles of Jesus. You have to explain things like the virgin birth. You have to explain the resurrection. You have to be able to um, scientifically prove it and um, establish some sort of man-made reasoning to be able to um, explain why these things are true. It's a cultural uh, fad that took off from philosophers and worldly men. Harvard introduced this into their curriculum, and before you know it, these subtle things that were introduced spiraled out of control, and here we are today. What once was a centerpiece of an alive wisdom going forth into the world that focused on the Word of God and taught science and history on these things around it, now has become a place of death, a dead wisdom. How so? Well, um, I'll just give you one of many examples. The latest Supreme Court justice was a top graduate of Harvard. She excelled greatly. She was intelligent. She was extremely smart. But when she was being interviewed for her job before Congress, they asked her a simple question. What is a woman? And what was her response? I'm not a biologist. Now, that's a statement that represents a bent against the triune God. That's a statement that represents a bent against God's natural order and how he has created all of humanity. It's a statement of rebellion that is sourced in a dead wisdom. As we look at our own lives, then, metaphorically speaking, how do we not become Harvard's? How do we guard against from going in from truth and veering into a dead wisdom? How do we go from being exposed to the Word of God and understanding the Word of God and what an alive wisdom is and a true wisdom and not go into a place of a dead wisdom? Well, that's what James guides us to in our passage today. James draws out what an alive wisdom is and what he's going to do in our passage in James 3, verses 13 through 18, is show us what an alive wisdom looks like, but then he contrasts that with a dead wisdom, and an evil wisdom. And he's going to show us that these two do not mix. You can't have both wisdoms functioning in your life. You just can't. So turn with me into James chapter 3 as we continue our study and pick it back up um, in verses 13 through 18. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above, it's first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Well, James, as you know, is a half-brother of Jesus, but he never lays claim to that in this book. Um, you see how humble he is at the very beginning of chapter 1. He calls himself a servant. 
Now, he could have thrown around the fact that, hey, I'm connected to Jesus this way. I'm, I have some of his blood, you know. But he doesn't. He says he's a servant of Christ. So he demonstrates a humility here that he teaches in this passage today that's seen in his letter. We also see James is a book of wisdom as well. James sometimes is called the, the Proverbs of the New Testament. So if you read the book of Proverbs and you see it's full of wisdom, and sometimes you might read a chapter a day in an entire month, you know, because there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, and to glean wisdom from, well, the book of James is the book of wisdom for the New Testament. When we read the book of James, what James is doing, he's acting upon a foundation that's assumed, meaning there are, there are truths here that when you get into it, it's easy to treat them as just morals if you don't think about James's foundation. But what is James's foundation? It's the gospel. It's Christ. It's the very fact that none of us, not one, is able to actually act righteous apart from Christ. Christ is the very foundation for us to be able to actually live a holy and righteous life. None of us can do that on our own. And so it's on the foundation of grace and mercy and the righteousness of Christ then that James writes his letter. So when we're reading the book of James, what we should guard ourselves against is the fact that uh, we have to be better people and more moral people and follow what James is saying. Instead, what we should look at is, first and foremost, where we fell, we, we should respond with repentance, but then look to Christ, and that's what we'll continue to see in our passage today. Now, James breaks this passage up into uh, three sections. First, there's an evident wisdom. So when we talk about what is an alive wisdom, it's evident. Um, secondly, there's an evil wisdom. This is the, the dead wisdom that we see um, so prominently in the world around us today. And then finally, um, we're going to see that an alive wisdom is an excellent wisdom. Okay? Evident, not evil, and alive, or excellent. So starting at verse 13, he begins with this question, who is wise and understanding among you? Now, there's a claim going on here among the churches that he's writing to. And there's a claim that people are wise, people are understanding, they know something, so you should listen to them. In the context, backing up to verse 1 of chapter 3, we see that people desire to become teachers. They desire to, to be heard. They thought they knew something and they wanted to teach it. Yet James gives them the warning that even though they desire to be teachers, they, teachers are judge of greater judgment greater strictness. This isn't the only claim that the believers here have been laying claim to. Um, some have been claiming faith when there are no works present in their life at all. And James wrote to them earlier at the end of chapter 2, if you back up, and you see that this claim of faith without works is actually a dead faith, a dead faith. They've also claimed other things, and they've used their, their words in ways that are contrary. Um, they've shown partiality, and James teaches on not showing partiality, and that was evident through their speech as well. Um, and then going back up into chapter 1, James calls them to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Well, the reason he calls them to do that is because they're people of quick speech. Yet, here we see another example of their quick speech. They're claiming to be wise, claiming to be understanding. James says, though, that um, these words should be with conduct. This claim should have proof to it. He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So it's not merely just words, then, that James says, okay, if you're wise and understanding, you say you are, you're good. No, there actually should be conduct that gives evidence to their claim. This conduct should be a good conduct, he says, and it should be done in the meekness of wisdom. Now, with this conduct, James is actually pulling from the Old Testament. He didn't just make this up out of nowhere, but he's been influenced by the Old Testament and his writings, and he's drawing that out. Um, write down Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, and uh, listen to it as I read, and you'll hear a lot of the similarities here. Deuteronomy 4 says, See, I have taught you statues and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, 
that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statues, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So what is the source then of the commandments? What is a picture of wisdom that the scripture gives us? Well, simply put, wisdom just isn't knowledge, but it's also following the commandments. It's also obedience. It's also action. Many times when we think of wisdom, what might pop in your head are, you know, old philosophers, old Greek philosophers, maybe with the Julius Caesar haircut, you know, and kind of bald on top, feather in their hand, writing, and uh, just all day, writing, writing, thinking, that might be what pops up in your head, but that's not the scriptural picture of wisdom. The scriptural picture of wisdom involves knowledge, yes, knowing truth, but it also involves action, engaging, living a life according to those truths. It's not enough to just know something, but James says that wisdom is also doing what you know. In fact, all of Scripture shows us that, as I just read from Deuteronomy 4. So wisdom, then, involves knowing truth and living truth, life and godliness. Now, you might ask, then, well, what's the source of this, then? How do we get to this place of doing, of living out wisdom? How do we obey the commandments? Well, Proverbs 9.10 says this. Proverbs 9.10 writes, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Did you hear that? The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. So in order to even talk about the subject of wisdom, we have to talk about what the fear of the Lord is. It's a worship of God. It's an understanding of His might, of His power, all His attributes, knowing God for God. You know, we say God is holy. We sang that song, holy, holy, holy. Uh, do you understand what that word means? That, under, that word communicates the fact that God is separate. God is like no other. See, we say God is good. We say God is righteous. We say God is love and merciful and graceful. Those are all his attributes. But holiness is like the big umbrella which all his attributes sits under. Holiness isn't just an attribute of God, but it's the very thing that defines all of his attributes and how God acts. So when we say, for example, um, oh, you know, Joe over there is, is merciful, he's graceful. And then when we say God is merciful and graceful, what we mean is that Joe it might demonstrate these characteristics of mercy and, and grace, but ultimately God is far greater And Joe says, amen to that. (laughs) God is far greater in his mercy. God is far greater in his grace. There's no one like God's mercy and grace. Nothing. God is holy. And our response then to that is the fact when we look at ourselves, we recognize that there's no way we can compare to God. Um, It humbles us. It brings us to a place of repentance and worship. Because we know how good God is, how far above us he is. That's the fear of the Lord. And that's the beginning of wisdom. It starts with recognizing that we are not the authority, but God is. Now, as believers in Christ, then, we have to ask the next question. Okay, so if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, what is the source of the fear of the Lord? 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 30 says this. And because of him, him being God, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What does Paul tell us there? Well, first and foremost, it's because of God we are in Christ Jesus. It's not because of our own wisdom, It's not because of our own strength. It's not because of our own might. But it's because of God we are in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It simply means to be united to him. We're united to Christ because of God. God's the one who does the work first and foremost. That's what Paul tells us there. 
So the fear of the Lord, if we have the fear of God, first and foremost, we have to recognize it's because of God's mercy and his grace that we have it. But secondly, we see that it starts and it ends with Christ. Because 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, who became to us wisdom from God. See, wisdom is not an idea. Wisdom is not this pie-in-the-sky thought. Wisdom is a person. It's Christ. When you read the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. Wisdom is given this kind of human characteristic. But we come to the New Testament, and ultimately we see wisdom is Christ. So when you think about wisdom then, you think about um, the commandments and following the Lord and the fear of the Lord that leads us to that. It's all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. We look to Jesus Christ. Now what does it mean to look to him? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.30 tells us that. He is our righteousness, meaning he lived this perfect life on earth and he gave us his righteousness, not our righteousness. And we're sanctified in sanctification, and it's because of Christ and his work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, that we can even be made holy. That's what that big word sanctification means. It simply means to be made holy, to be made like God, because of God. And redemption, Christ died on the cross. Christ saved us. He bought us. He purchased us. And it's in that then we can fear the Lord and live out the commandments. We can actually do what we know because of Christ and Christ alone. So this morning then, if you're a believer in Christ and you're struggling with sin and you're struggling to obey, um, the goal isn't to look within yourself or for your own strength, but the goal is to look to Christ, your Savior, the one who's redeemed you, the one who's sanctified you. You look to him Get to his word, get to the voice of God, and read him and dwell upon him. When you fail to do that, Proverbs 8, 36 tells us something. Proverbs 8, 36 says, But he who fails to find me, and this is wisdom speaking, injures himself. All who hate me, wisdom, love death. There are only two roads you can take. One, the road of life. Second, the road of death. That's it. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. The only exception to this is when we find wisdom, we find wisdom when we love the death on the cross. When we love death, the death on the cross, that's when we find wisdom. So then the conduct stems first and foremost from understanding the source of wisdom, which is not ourselves, and secondly, the wisdom being lived out and exercising wisdom derives from the Lord. But James uses this word meekness here. What does the word meekness mean? He talks about humility. Humility opposes pride. Humility is the position that when we see God for who he is, we ought to take. We ought to bend our knees before the most holy God. We ought to get low before God because he is mighty and he is powerful. You know, uh, when you look at one of the best exercises to do for your legs, it's the squat. And uh, whether you're an amateur or you're professional, the squat is one of the best ways to do it. However, if you don't do the squat correctly, then you're not going to grow strong. If you don't bend your knees, if you don't get low, then you're not actually going to build your muscle. You're not actually going to grow. Well, as Christians, likewise, if we don't bend our knees before Christ, if we don't humble ourselves before Christ, if we don't look to him as the source of wisdom and um, living within this truth, then we're not going to grow as Christians. We're just not. We're not going to be in fellowship with God. So this morning, where is your heart at? Are you humbling your own heart, believer? Brothers and sisters, are we um, examining ourselves and our actions and our lives? And Do we see a godly wisdom and a live wisdom that's evident in our conduct? Or are we living counter to it? 
Are we living in our own pride, our own selfishness? Are we living life based on what we think is right or what's best for us or what makes us feel good in the moment? Does our conduct give evidence of an alive wisdom? Well, James paints the picture of an alive wisdom, but secondly, he moves to an evil wisdom. I'm going to reread verses 14 through 16. It says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So this claim that they've been claiming that they're wise and understanding, James says, wake up. Because essentially when you claim those things um, and yet your conduct does not match up to that, you're lying. You're going against the truth. You're being false to the truth. And yet they're boasting about these things as well. And so the lie then that we see here is when we understand what true wisdom is and we proclaim we have it, but we don't live life according to it, uh, we're, we're liars. We're not being honest with ourselves. We might come into church on a Sunday morning and put on a smile, look all cleaned up. Maybe some of us showered last night, maybe two nights ago, maybe three nights ago, we won't judge. Um, but then you come in and all's good. You look good. Yet on the inside, your life is a disaster. Monday, when you go into work, when you get around the guys, your language looks nothing like a, a Christian. The things you say on a Monday, can you say those on a Sunday? Maybe you gossip, slander. Did you see so-and-so? Did you hear about what that person did? These things are things that counter the truth. They're not an alive wisdom, but they stem from a dead wisdom, an evil wisdom, a wisdom that's not true. James says he describes this display of an evil wisdom through relationships. So if you want to know where your heart is, look at how you interact with other people. That tells you. He uses two terms here, jealousy and ambition, and he um, gives a couple adjectives for both these terms. This bitter jealousy. Jealousy in the scripture, we talked about this actually on a Friday night Bible study, um, can be a good thing. You see places in scripture where the word jealous is used in a good way. But here James adds an adjective, bitter jealousy. So what he's doing is he's not talking about a good form of jealousy, but he's talking about the bad form, the form that you don't want. Bitter jealousy. Bitter, that word's also an interesting word because that word is typically used in that time frame to talk about water that's tainted, water that's gone sour, water that's not good to drink. So this type of jealousy is this type of jealousy you don't want to drink of, you don't want to partake in. It's bitter. Ambition, that's this drive for self. That's this desire to exceed and, and to accomplish your goals, but not for anything else but for your own success, your own heart, your own life. And James says it's selfish. It's self-focused. It's self-considering only. It's desiring of the self. And so these two things are bound up in the heart, and this is where he gets to the root of an evil wisdom, of a dead wisdom, and that it's sourced first and foremost in the heart. These two things are there. But it comes out in our relationships with, with one another. The story goes of a lady who came to her pastor one day, and the lady said to her pastor, she said, you know, pastor, I'm really struggling with this sin. The pastor is very concerned, especially for a congregant struggling with sin. And so he asked her, he says, okay, what's the sin? What's going on? And she says, well, every time I enter into the church building, I, I'm looking around, and I just can't help but notice that I'm the most beautiful lady in the room. No one else can compare to my looks. I'm looking around, and I'm, this is just an issue I'm, I'm struggling with. Pastor, what do I do? Pastor thinks for a moment, and he says, sister, this isn't a sin. This is a mistake. Some of you will get that later. 
Send me my email, me on it later. <laughs> you know, we do that all the time. We compare ourselves to one another. And when we compare ourselves to one another, one of two things happens. Either bitter jealousy or selfish ambition. See, when I'm comparing myself to somebody, and if I say, oh, so-and-so over there, he's not as holy as me. He goes out and he says, he cusses, these, and says things are not biblical. He uh, maybe drinks too much. Um, so-and-so, maybe he's, uh, you know, uh, sleeping around with his girlfriend. Um, maybe so-and-so, she's gossiping. Um, she doesn't really care for her, her, herself much or for her home much. What you do is you begin to build yourself up. And when you build yourself up, there's selfish ambition that comes about. This is a deadly wisdom. This is a wisdom of, that's not sourced in the Lord. Yet, on the other hand, when you're comparing yourself to people, and maybe you say, man, that person, he's just, he's holy. He's good. And I, I wish I was like him. I wish, I wish I had that role. I wish I had that position. I wish I could be up here singing, or I wish I could be up here teaching, or maybe I wish I could be known for that. And when you begin to compare yourselves to people who you view are better than yourself, then bitter jealousy comes about. One of two things happens when we compare ourselves. And this is what James is drawing out in our relationships with one another. When we look at each other, our goal shouldn't be to compare ourselves. Our goal should be to see each other bought with the blood of our Savior, bought with Christ who are also fellow sinners turned saints because of Christ Jesus and his righteousness. If not, brothers and sisters, we will look at each other and compare ourselves and jealousy, ambition will arise in our hearts because this is a wisdom that is evil. It's wicked. How do we know it's evil? Well, James tells us it's earthly unspiritual and demonic earthly one other way to describe it is worldly it's a wisdom that's from the world see the world says this is true or this is right and it's not biblical it's not from truth back in this context in this day when james would have said this the reader's understanding would have been idolatry and pagan paganistic practices False worship and temples abounded in many of these cities that will receive these letters. So worldly wisdom to them would be, well, if I need something or I got to get something accomplished, let me go to this temple or let me go to this false god and pray for it. And just maybe, maybe he'll give it. Maybe I can conjure something up or maybe I can work hard to achieve it. In our day and age, what does worldly wisdom look like? Well, it's the same thing at the root but it plays out differently. The root is still a denial against God. The root is still a refusal to go look to him. But now in our day and age, it's, we look to mankind. We look to ourselves. See, you look through history, and you see that no point in history is like our point today, where we recognize that human autonomy is the greatest source of authority. There's nothing above humans. Now, back then, at least they had idols that um, they had to submit to and humble themselves to, though it was still false and wicked and paganistic. But in our day and age, humanity sees ourselves as the top. There's no one we need to humble ourselves to. So much so that we define morality. We even define marriage. We have the, the guts to do that. Instead of looking at a marriage between Adam and Eve, we say it's between Adam and Steve. That's okay. But we've all even gone farther than that, haven't we? Because now we say Steve can become Eve and Eve can become Steve. Right? That's the fruit of human autonomy. It's foolishness. It's wickedness. It's a dead wisdom. It's of this world. Secondly, James says it's unspiritual. This, another way to say it, would be fleshly, of our own flesh. In James 1, if you back up a couple of chapters, James says that we ought to guard our hearts because our desires quickly turn and run after our own lusts. That's our flesh, the things we desire. You know, we can take something so good in this world 
and just make it evil. We could take things that God's given us, like um, wine, and, and get drunk on it and turn it into an idol. We can take other things that God's given us, like sex within marriage, and turn it into wickedness. We could turn cars, wealth, clothes, anything you can think of, we turn it into idols and evil. That's our flesh that leads us into that. John Calvin describes it well. He says our hearts are factories that make idols, things that we idolize. We, um, it's amazing what we, we create and bring about and bow our knees to. That's a dead wisdom. That's flesh of the flesh. Again, we see that live and active in our world today too. We hear phrases like, just look within your own self. Um, find a strength within your own heart. Love yourself. Look within. And Disney's the epitome of this, isn't it? Look to your own heart. That's the, the gospel according to Disney. But all it is is looking to the flesh. It's unspiritual. It's a dead wisdom. Thirdly, it's demonic. You don't have to go far into the opening pages of Scripture to see what this wisdom looks like. Genesis chapter 3, you see the demonic wisdom on display. What does Satan do when he comes and tempts Eve? Well, he gets her to question God's goodness. He lies about God. This demonic wisdom lies about God's nature and God's goodness and God's mercy, all of who God is. It, that's the goal of this type of wisdom. Yet, it's dead. There's nothing alive in it. And so we see that it's evil because where this wisdom is sourced from. Now, all three of those, if you've ever thought about the Christian life having enemies before, all three of those capture all the enemies we deal with. Our flesh, the world, Satan, those are the enemies we're up against constantly, day in and day out. Sometimes it's all three at one time. Sometimes it's just one. Maybe two. How do we fight? Well, not with the wisdom of the world. Not with the wisdom of the world. James says it right there. And he says, if you do, then what results is disorder and every vile practice. These two words are interesting, disorder and vile. Disorder, this uh, actually has to do with social upheaval, rioting, rebellion, these sorts of things. And so James essentially says the results, the fruit when you exercise a deadly wisdom is that chaos erupts. The world's gone crazy. I mean, you look at the riots in our world and you see that what's the root of that is wickedness, evil, vile. Vile refers to worthless things. Um, not necessarily um, heinous acts like murder or adultery, though that can be incorporated into that. But what James is getting at more so, it's the things that we do to each other in our day-to-day -day lives. The things that we might do to undercut each other, get at each other, um, ruin each other's reputation, make each other look bad, even in subtle ways. That's really what James is getting at. Those are the fruits. That's the, the link to wickedness. The link to what's going on is ultimately the heart. It's a dead wisdom. So this morning, as you consider that, um, do you consider the things you've said? Do you need to repent of something? Do you need to repent of living in the dead wisdom, of a wicked wisdom? Do you need to ask God for strength to overcome the three enemies that we're up against, to fight them, and to look to the Lord? Finally, we see that in the, act, uh, in the live wisdom is an excellent wisdom. That's how James ends this passage. He says there in verse 17 and 18, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, open reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Uh, I just don't have time to get into every one of those words, but I do want to point out that first pure, this is the motive. This is the motive of what's going on at the heart level. Another word for that would be holy. So in this alive wisdom, it's characterized by holiness. We've already unpacked who's holy. God's holy. It's a reflection of God's holiness lived out. And the fruits of that, the characteristics, result as peace, which counters disorder, doesn't it? 
gentleness. This word has to do more so with um, how you act in face of controversy. When someone says something about you, when someone does something to, to just irritate you, to frustrate you, what's your response? So that's really what that word's getting at, not, not this kind of softness, but more so what's your reaction in the face of controversy? Open to reason. Um, you know, so many times we think we know something and we pride ourselves on that and we stand on that, but open to reason means we consider, we listen, we think about in light of the truth. Or will mercy, good fruits, impartial and sincere, genuine, honest, not fake, not putting on a front, but true. And the result of this is a richness. The result of this righteousness is a rich harvest of righteousness, sown in peace. You go to any person on the street and you ask them, do you want peace? Any sane person would say, yes, of course. In fact, we all desire peace. We all desire a life to wake up in the morning and not be at somebody's throat or not be in conflict or not have issues at work or issues in the home. We all desire peace. And James says, for the believer in Christ, when we exercise an excellent wisdom, we will have peace. Now, that might not change the circumstances around you. But that might be a peace that is settled in your heart. Maybe it's a peace between another believer in Christ. Maybe you're reconciled in a relationship that's been torn apart and you're brought together through a godly wisdom, an alive wisdom, a wisdom that's not of the world but in Christ. So James has pointed us to an alive wisdom through the evidence of it, through the fact that it's not like an evil wisdom, and the fact that it's an excellent wisdom. So this morning, is your life characterized by a true, alive wisdom? Again, you can't try to mix in secularism, or you can't try to mix in a, a dead wisdom from one of those enemies we saw with it. Your life is either characterized by it, or it's not. If it's not, then you have repentance to do. Think about your own heart. Think about how you govern yourself. Um, in the moments where someone does something to anger you, what do you do? What's your response? In the moments when you're presented with temptation, where do you turn to? Where do you flee? In the moments where it's just so tempting to lash out, what's your response to that? Husbands, wives, how do you treat your spouses? Do you mock them? Do you make fun of them? Do you talk with a tone? Do you cut them in attitude? Do you come at them? Do you struggle? Do you hate them for some reason? Is there bitterness over something they've done? Well, and the dead wisdom would say, well, let me act in that. Let me continue hating this person. But an alive wisdom would say, well, let me, as Christ forgives, forgive. Live in truth. Live in peace. If you don't have peace within your marriage, then that's because a dead wisdom and not an alive wisdom is being lived out. With your kids, what's your response to your kids? Do you yell at your kids? Do you get frustrated? Do you lose your temper easily with them? Well, that's a dead wisdom, not an alive wisdom. Your kids ought to see you the same person in public as you are behind doors. If not, seek Christ. Repent. With your coworkers, with society, with your job, you come to church on Sunday, and that's wonderful, but do you take these truths into your careers, into the home, into shopping and working and conversations? If not, you're living in a dead wisdom and not in a live wisdom. You might say, Chris, I hear you. I get it, but it's just so hard. It's so difficult. You know, it's hard to forgive. It's hard to, to change my behaviors. It's hard because my initial reaction is just, just to cuss or, or talk about sexual morality or look at pornography or whatever. Well, this morning, this is where we look to the one who is the definition of wisdom. If you remember, wisdom is not an idea, it's a person. And we look to Christ who has paid the price on the cross 
His death forgave us and cleansed us of our sin. And his resurrection gave us his righteousness. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we have a relationship with God. But it's just not, okay, positioned there, and that's great. But from that, being positioned before the Lord and being centered in Christ and united to Christ enables us to live a holy life. It's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us and molds us into the image of Christ. So this morning, if you're struggling to overcome sin, if you're struggling to change, look to the one who is wisdom. Look to Christ who died on the cross and rose again. When you leave here for lunch, skip lunch and go and bow your knee to Christ and pray and cry out to him. Look to him in the word and dwell upon his truths and meditate and just just stop. Get away from the phone. Get away from everything. Just dwell and meditate upon his riches and his goodness. That's the source of true wisdom. And that's the only way you can overcome sin. You cannot overcome sin in your own strength. You cannot overcome sin just being a better person. You cannot overcome sin putting together a plan and saying, I'm going to stick to it. No, brothers and sisters, this morning it starts with Christ. And it ends with Christ. And all of it is Christ because he is wisdom. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom you've given us in Christ. Lord, to you be the glory and the praise and the wonder Father, strengthen us in this truth this morning. We are sinful people who desperately need to live in wisdom. And we recognize that wisdom is sourced in you and you alone. Thank you, God. To you be the glory and the mercy, Father. Thank you for the wisdom you've given us through Christ. Father, you are good. You are holy. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, now we continue to glorify God and worship him for being the source of wisdom. And we come to the Lord's Supper, a time of communion, a time of recognizing that Christ has given himself to us. See, the bread and the juice here, these are um, elements God has given us to remember who Christ is, to dwell upon the gospel, and to love it. Now, these things, there's nothing magical about them. You, if you think that once you partake of these things, you're going to be a better person or you're going to have grace, Maybe you'll just, God will, will be so pleased with you. Maybe you'll wipe the slate clean if you, if you partake of these things and start your week fresh. If you think any of that, you're thinking wrongly. That, that's a dead wisdom. It's not true. See, because in these things, there's nothing magical about it. They are symbolic of the work of Christ, what Christ has done. But we also don't approach this moment like a check-the-box thing. And what I mean by that is we don't say, well, you know, we got to do this because Christ told us to do it, so we do it. No, this is, this is a means of grace. And when I say that, I mean it's an instrument by which it points our hearts and our minds to the grace of Christ. It's a beautiful time together that we come and we celebrate and we think upon the work of Christ. So when you're holding the bread and when you're holding the juice, what you ought to be doing is thinking about the gospel, thinking about the fact that Christ gave his body, shed his blood for you as a believer in Christ. That's wonderful. It's so sweet and so amazing. That also means, though, if you're not a believer, you should not be partaking of this meal. There's our warnings in Scripture that say, do not partake because this does not represent who you are in Christ. This does not represent the fact that you are a Christian. So during this time when the elements are passed out, what I'm going to ask you to do if you're not a believer is don't eat or drink. Instead, think about the truths you heard this morning from the gospel. If you're unclear, read 1 Corinthians 15. In the first few verses, you'll see truths of the gospel there.
Logistically speaking, the elements will be passed to you. So a couple of guys will come forward and bring them to you. And there's a symbolic nature to that because we want to drive home the fact that grace is given to you. Grace is given by Christ. It's freely. You don't, you don't work for it. And then after you take the elements, hold on to them, and then we'll walk through Scripture and then partake together. All right, well, let's pray, and then we'll enter into this time of the Lord's Supper. Lord, we thank you for the sacrament you've given us. We thank you that we can dwell upon it, that we can enjoy it, that we can love this time to partake together, that we can dwell upon the gospel first and foremost. Thank you, Father. Use this, God, to sanctify us in your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're reading from Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26. Matthew wrote, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us eat. 
And he took a cup when he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink. Christ ends by saying, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Father, we thank you that one day Christ will return. And he will return to judge the living <coughs> the judge the living and the dead. And until that day, strengthen us. And may we look to Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us stand and sing and worship and joy of our risen Savior, who is the wisdom of the world. days that God has numbered I was made to walk with him yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the king of kings but mine is hope in my redeemer though I fall his love is sure for christ has paid for every failing i am his forevermore mine are tears in times of sorrow darkness not yet understood though the valley i must travel where i see no earthly good but mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need I know my pain will not be wasted. Christ completes his work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a narrow way one with christ i will encounter harm and hatred for his name but mine is armor for this battle strong enough to last the war and he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore and mine are keys to zion city where beside the king i walk for there my heart has found its treasure christ is mine forevermore rejoice now O oh my soul for his love is my reward fear is gone and hope is sure Christ is mine forevermore come rejoice now O oh my soul for his love is my reward fear is gone and hope is sure christ is mine forevermore and mine are keys to zion city where beside the king i walk 
For there my heart has found its treasure Christ is mine forevermore Christ is mine forevermore All right, well, this morning we um, have the honor to be able to celebrate both sacraments. So not only the Lord's Supper, but baptism. So you may be seated as you rejoice and worship together as a church at this. So we have two brothers being uh, baptized this morning. Um, and so I'm going to call Fernando and Joey up now. So please make your way forward. Uh, as they make their way forward, I want to talk a little bit about what baptism is. Because this, again, much like the Lord's Supper, is not something that gives grace. This is not something that infuses or, or even saves these men here. Uh, th this is a declaration of the transformation that has already taken place in their heart. The very fact that the Spirit of God has regenerated them and transformed them at the preaching of the Word of God. And so baptism is a declaration of that. that baptism is a declaration of um, faith, of repentance and belief. And belief and repentance has marked both of these men's lives. Now, baptism isn't something that you say, well, you have to clean yourself up for before you do it. You don't make yourself holy. You don't make yourself righteous. You don't make yourself a good person to be baptized. It's Christ who regenerates you, who saves you, and um, his righteousness is given. And so baptism is a declaration of the good news, the gospel that is presented to us for. And so as we dwell upon it, we say baptism is a sign, and it's a seal, a sign of the salvation of the gospel is given to us, and it's a seal. It's a, it's a promise that the Lord has given us, every believer, the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a promise that we can look back to the day we're baptized to remember, especially in the suffering times and the hard times, that God has sealed us, God has saved us, um, God has redeemed us. And so baptism is a wonderful thing. Um, is if you've not been baptized, please talk to me after. For all you believers this morning as a church, uh, as you see these men baptized, remember what the Lord has done for you in your baptism as well. <clears throat> 